All right. So uh, we're interviewing Paul Pettit, uh, uh, public health director. Wanted to talk to him as we uh, kind of head into the fall and winter season. And, you know, we're also seeing what appears to be a little, uh, maybe a little uptick in active cases. So I wanted to get his uh, input on that and see where we are. So, uh, Paul, thank you for joining us today. I know, as always, you're very busy. Yeah, absolutely happy to uh, chat today. Um, yeah, it's, it's been busy as of late. Uh, you know, as, as you just mentioned, we have seen a little bit of an uptick that we can obviously uh, talk about a little bit, but uh, always happy to engage and, uh, you know, talk talk with our residents and try again to share uh, as much as we can what's going on locally. You know, again, we see nationally, statewide, even regionally sometimes, you know, what's going on with COVID, but we don't always, um, you know, sometimes get, get, get the full flavor of what's going on locally. And, uh, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, we're heading into the fall, the colder season, which has always kind of been the, the concern as we looked you know, at the progression of things here that we figured we'd see a lull over the summer, which I think for all intents and purposes, we did. Um, you know, obviously, we report our numbers every day and, and you know, Howard and the other uh, you know, media outlets, um, you know, usually publish those. And you can see we had a fairly low um, activity rate throughout most of the summer. Uh, but we are heading back inside a little bit. Things are starting to get buttoned up and, uh, you know, closed doors, people, uh, you know, not having as much fresh air and distancing. And, uh, you know, we have started to see some of the numbers creep back up. So uh, ha happy to be here to chat and answer some questions and, um, you know, uh, see, see what people need to know. Thanks, Paul. Uh, when I look at the uh, I was looking at the chart uh, of active cases last night and, it, you know, it is showing a little spike right now. Kind of, uh, what do you attribute that to? Yeah, I mean, you know, it goes back to some of the things we talked about. Uh, we have seen, uh, you know, some increased activity. We have, we have a, a bit of a cluster going on. Obviously, I think folks have seen in, in that area. Uh, and obviously, with the Elba School going remote only for the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, it's been indicative of some increased activity. You know, what we can see is there is some connection, obviously, in the social side. I do want to say we haven't seen any community or uh, school spread uh, amongst these, um, you know, different students in Elba. They're more connected on the community side. Uh, you know, so there are there are some different different things that we're identifying, um, you know, as some commonality and connections with some of these cases. Some of them involved uh, some social gatherings, some birthday parties, different types of events that may have uh, lent itself to Again, maybe closer contact, prolonged contact that would have, uh, you know, potentially led to some of these uh, uh, transmissions. Uh, so ultimately, if, if you look around, um, you know, locally and even regionally, it, it's really tied back to a lot of these different social gatherings that are that are occurring. Um, you know, that we're seeing a lot of these uh, spikes and increases, whether they're, you know, social or whether they're, um, you know, in different uh, formal settings. Unfortunately, um, you know, not, not everyone's maybe following all the guidelines that have been put out there with the masking and the social distancing requirements. And uh, what we do know about COVID is, um, you know, it, it does like to spread. It likes those type of environments where you have high densities of people uh, without social distancing, without masking. Uh, it's much more likely to spread in those scenarios. So we, we've seen that locally, but even uh, regionally and around the state, which is again leading to some of these increases in numbers. You know, I'll, I'll ask a job uh, question from my my perspective that may apply generally. I mean, you know, my job, I have to interact with a lot of people. Uh, I take the approach when I'm inside, I wear a mask. When I know I'm going to be up close with people, I wear a mask. But, you know, I cover a lot of, say, accidents and stuff, other events outside. Uh, and we're all kind of staying a few feet apart at least, if not six feet apart. Uh, I'm not as concerned about that, and I'm not as concerned if I'm not around a lot of people talking. Uh, am I being too lax or uh, exercising a, a, a reasonable discretion? You know, I, I think it's it's a case by case, um, you know, basis with some of these things. I mean, we do know that we're more concerned with indoors and, and closed uh, buildings where, you know, you may have a, a better environment, I guess, for a virus to circulate for a little bit longer. Uh, potentially, you know, when you're outdoors, that is viewed as obviously a, a safer environment uh, with natural air and movement. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the guidelines and, and the um, what we know about COVID now, uh, six feet is really that target distance that we're looking at. I mean, there's been some studies that have come out of, uh, you know, even even the CDC looking at that it may even be a little bit further than six feet. So, you know, when we look at distancing, especially without wearing masks, uh, you know, it's really that six foot distance we're looking at. 
Uh, so ultimately, with your question, Howard, I would I would encourage you to try to you know keep that six foot distance if you're not wearing the mask uh, as best as possible, and just keep in mind the masks are not uh, a foolproof plan. I mean, we hear that a lot that oh I'm wearing a mask I don't need to worry about it. The reality is masks are made up of a lot of different types of materials. Uh, they're not all the same. You know, some have uh, you know two or three layers. Some are more like a buff or just some type of a face covering. Uh, so there's really not one set standard or one set way to know for sure that you're protecting others, uh, which is ultimately the goal of, of the mask, um, you know, the general face mask, because we're not talking about N95s in this scenario. So uh, again, we're encouraging folks to, you know, try to try to keep that six foot distance as much as possible or wear the masks uh, and or wear the masks, uh, especially when not able to maintain six foot distance. Uh, when you're out in public, are you uh, satisfied with the amount of mask wearing you're seeing and the way people are wearing masks? Any concerns there? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, overall, and, and we've talked about this many times over the last, I guess, seven months now, it's hard to believe, but, uh, you know, the reality is I think our folks have done, a, a, overall, a great job. Uh, you know, I, I'm typically overly impressed uh, when we're out and about, you know, we have our own workers out, you know, many, many folks are out and about, and, you know, we do get some complaints here or there about different businesses, maybe not following the rules, but, you know, that's not, not you know, in the scheme of things, it's not much as, as it could be or it was originally when these um, you know initial regulations came out but uh you know so overall yes I, I am pleased with the general efforts i know it's challenging and tough uh it's not what anybody wants to be doing and myself included uh you know but it is something that has shown to uh keep this the spread down and, and to keep folks uh you know protected during these times as we uh you know wait for uh vaccine at this point so i would encourage people to you know stay vigilant continue doing it um, you know, uh, I guess for some people it's become somewhat more routine at this point. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, I, I'd like to, um, you know, just uh, yeah, support that uh, the fact that this is being well, um, you know, adhered to by the majority of folks. Uh, you know, back to that uh, spike we're seeing a little bit. Uh, do you get uh, stats on kind of what the positivity rate is on tests? And also anything else you can tell us your feelings about the actual prevalence uh, in the community? Um, yes, I don't have that data right in front of me, but um, that is something that we do uh, track, obviously. Uh, we know the number of tests that are coming in and the number of positives, so we, we can obviously uh, produce that if you'd like that number, um, you know, after, after we're done chatting. Uh, but yeah, obviously, you know, the numbers are creeping up a little bit, you know, and I've reported on this too. Keep in mind that a lot of our numbers are repeat numbers. They're not individualized specific tests. Um, you know, we do have all of our uh, skilled nursing facilities, long-term care type facilities that do uh, weekly testing as part of the state mandates. So they have to get tested every week. So that again goes into that number. Uh, but one thing we do uh, obviously is track, you know, when we do have folks on quarantine, we do offer to test them around day seven when they are on quarantine. And uh, we have had some of those folks uh, start to come back positive. Um, and then again, those are direct you know, direct exposures. And you can see that in our reporting when we release our data every day that, you know, if the, per the new positives were on quarantine or not on quarantine. So that gives you an indication, you know, whether they're new cases that we weren't aware of or if they were part of a, an exposure and an additional case, whether they've now become positive. Uh, but with the cluster and uh, that we're seeing up in the Alba area, uh, you know, again, the, the positivity rate um, is increasing there. We are getting more testing done in that area uh, by these folks and by us with uh, the ones on quarantine. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the positivity rate is increasing in that general area. For the rest of the county, it's, it's remaining pretty much flat at the moment. Paul, I wanted to ask you about uh, schools. Uh, it was interesting to me that you mentioned that you know, like uh, the outbreak, I think it's in, like, primarily in Elba or that part of the county that is, it's not really happening at the schools, it's happening some social it's gatherings. Social gatherings. For schools, are you satisfied with how things are going at the schools, the way the school districts are responding, and any uh, words of wisdom or advice for parents uh, in navigating this? Yeah, so schools have uh, been a big challenge, and I know all the parents out there and, and the school districts, the administration on down to the teachers, this has been a very long process, right? Um, you know, they closed last spring. Um, that was a long process in itself, and it's just in kind of a, a slow, uh, revolving, evolving situation. And uh, you know, it's been it's been a huge frustration uh, for all of us, to be honest with you. Even when you look at the planning for school reopenings this fall, um, you know, the lack of clear guidance from the governor's office and the state department of health is uh, really 
I think contributed some of the uh, contributed to a lot of the concerns and frustrations that we've had. Um, and you know, I, I do want I do want to say that uh, I've had a great working relationship with our superintendents. Uh, we communicate uh, very regularly, um, maybe more than we'd like to <laughs> at, at some level. But you know, ultimately, there's been there's been great collaboration between the schools and the county trying to figure this all out. Um, you know, and, and working again with our community providers who are obviously looped in and part of this process with the need to have uh, symptomatic kids uh, uh, tested, et cetera. So uh, it has been a huge collaborative effort. And uh, overall, um, you know, things so far have been uh, fairly good. Besides, obviously, the, the cluster and some of the issues we've had, you know, well, again, not necessarily related to what's happening at the school. Uh, I think the schools have done a great job of putting their plans together. Um, we have not seen significant uh, cluster having seen any unit or any school spread uh, where we had a positive student and a secondary student uh, based on an exposure at this point. And obviously, we're uh, six weeks or so into the school year. So again, those are all great things. It just shows that the schools are following through on their plans. Again, they all had to submit plans to get them approved by the state. Uh, they take into account social distancing, masking, cleaning, uh, you know, all the other different uh, parameters around the guidance that they were required to do. And uh, you know, with what we've seen so far, we're, we're very pleased. Uh, again, there's uh, ongoing daily communication between us and the schools uh, with different scenarios, uh, you know, this circumstance, that situation. And we've been uh, very, um, uh, very uh, supported and very, um, uh, I guess, a lot of cooperation at this point to make sure uh, we're doing our best to keep uh, the cases out of the schools. You know, for the parents, uh, there was just an updated uh, toolkit that just came out. Uh, it was a kind of the clinical guidance, and this again is something that we went on from the state about eight weeks, um, and they finally got it to us a little over a week ago. Uh, it provided some additional flexibility on the testing mandate and um, you know the requirement to uh, see a, a primary care provider, et cetera, on positive symptom screens. Uh, the best thing we can tell parents is we, we, we understand it's frustrating and challenging and, and you know some of these uh, uh, restrictions that the governor has put in place in the guidance documents are a bit draconian um, on the surface and you know especially needing to be pulled out of school if you have a, a headache or you have an upset stomach and those type of things. So, you know, we are we are trying to work with the schools, with the school nurses, and the um, provider community uh, to do our best to make sure we can keep our kids in school. Um, obviously, that's where we want them to be able to be, uh, to be there learning and, and um, you know at school as, as much as possible uh, within within the scope of the guidelines. So, uh, the biggest thing I can tell you, if, if your kid is is symptomatic, has any of those things, you know, don't send them to school. Uh, we've had a few scenarios where the kids have gone to school and unfortunately. Uh, you know, maybe been in class for a bit and then get screened out positive. And uh, that just creates, uh, you know, some uh, interesting dynamics, especially if, uh, you know, unfortunately the person did come back positive. We haven't had that yet, but it is possible. Uh, so, you know, keep your kids home uh, if they're sick, no different than if they have uh, any colds and flu. Uh, the advice is really the same, no matter what. Uh, but ultimately, the more we can, um, you know, just try to keep any symptomatic kids out of the school setting for now, um, you know, especially is, is what we really want to focus on. Uh, but, you know, we're, again, good collaboration, and uh, overall, you know, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with how um, the interaction and communication has been with all the schools in the county so far. Uh, in the Batavia School Board meeting the other night, night the uh, Superintendent uh, Annabelle uh, Solar uh, talked about restrictions for doctors have, um, are not as stringent. I think before, it had to, there had to be a negative test come back if the kids were symptomatic. As I understand it, they're getting, doctors now have more discretion to say, you know, I don't know. For example, I know this is an allergy. We don't need to do a test. Uh, has, has that kind of reason? Have doctors been given more discretion on allowing kids to go back to school? Yeah, so that was, uh, you know, part of this updated toolkit. And uh, there's several uh, algorithms slash flow sheets, whatever you want to call them, that are now have been released as part of this updated guidance that I, I know all, I believe all the, um, you know, schools have up on their website. We have it, you know, up, up, a link on our websites, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, these have been updated and it did allow for some additional flexibility for, um, you know, our, our uh, primary care physicians and, and health care providers in, in the community. Originally, when the guidance came out, it was uh, required a, physician uh, note and a negative test and an improvement in symptoms before they were allowed to return. Uh, this new flexibility gives them the option to have an alternate diagnosis, which is I think what you're referencing potentially like seasonal allergies 
or some other uh, respiratory illness that the doctor is aware of and is comfortable signing off on essentially that this is what's going on with this student and um, they're able to come back again, obviously, when they don't have any uh, potential symptoms or, um, you know, maybe infectious, et cetera. Uh, the other alternative, obviously, is they can still get the COVID test, um, you know, and, and the student can now come back with that negative test result uh, without necessarily having to uh, see their primary care physician. Uh, but ultimately, that, you know, leads us into another area which, you know, continues to be a challenge for us is access to testing. Um, you know, this has not improved for us here in Genesee County, Orleans, pretty much any rural county in the state. Uh, we've been beating the drums uh, significantly, um, as you're well aware, Howard, since uh, back in March when we, uh, you know, started to see our first cases. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we still are very, very limited uh, with our access to testing. It actually became more restrictive uh, about a month and a half ago when, uh, you know, our health care facilities, most of the primary care docs only started doing uh, testing of symptomatic folks uh, only. And, you know, so again, for the requirements for optional screens for, you know, going back to college, for, uh, you know, people that want to go visit their loved ones in the nursing home that now have to have a negative test within seven days, none of our local facilities were offering uh, those uh, types of tests because folks weren't symptomatic. And if they were able to get them, they were getting charged a pretty significant amount. And, uh, you know, that is not appropriate. It's something that we have, um, you know, my, myself personally advocated for almost every day, really. Um, our elected officials from local all the way up to our state elected officials continue to push the governor's office for increased uh, free testing for our residents. I mean, it's essential the way the governor has set up these guidelines with testing requirements and the need to have negative tests for various reasons. Um, it's, it's not, it's not uh, um, uh, rational and, and, and um, you know, that we should be able to meet these guidelines without having the testing. So, I mean, you can't have both. I mean, if you want to put guidelines in place, um, you know, that's debatable anyways, but if you want to put them in place, you at least have to have the ability to uh, meet the intent of the guidelines so we're not in violation and we're not putting pressures and challenges on our residents that they have to, you know, make choices on, do I get tested to visit a loved one or, you know, do I potentially you know, have money to go get groceries this week? I mean, and, and, you know, it's something that we, uh, you know, continue to fight for, and uh, it, it has been a problem, and, and it's an issue that we're having with school. You know, our kids have been uh, symptom screened out, um, okay, so now they need to get the negative test, and if you can't get the test, if you got to go to a healthcare provider and they're, they're billing you insurance, your insurance for a, a healthcare visit, you know, at $100, $150, um, you know, just to get your kid back in school, that, that shouldn't be that way. So we need to get uh, rapid testing. Uh, we need it now. And uh, we are working on it. Uh, we're working with Oak Orchard, both in Orleans and Genesee County. Uh, they, they do have some of these uh, testing machines, and we're just waiting on the test kits and the antigen to be able to use them. Uh, we're also um, working on getting some rapid testing machines from the state uh, that we could um, deploy and potentially use uh, more broadly for some of these testing needs. Uh, you know, but that, that's really key. We, we need to get access to this rapid testing so that we can get folks where they need to go. Um, again, 99% plus of our uh, testing at the moment is negative for COVID. So um, there's a high, high likelihood that whatever respiratory illness you may have or any of the symptoms are not COVID. So we want to get folks back on their way, back into school, able to visit their loved ones as quickly as we can. Well, that's all very interesting on testing, Paul. Thank you for filling us in. The, um, we're now entering flu season. Uh, what's your message to the community uh, You know, in the age of COVID as we enter the flu season? Yeah, I mean, the messaging hasn't changed. You know, I, I, we do these PSAs year to year to year. Uh, you know, get your flu shot. Um, this is a standard line uh, from the health, health departments, health care providers uh, from year to year. Uh, it's no different in the COVID year beyond that, um, you know, we are, are, are extra sensitive to, you know, potentially have concurrent issues. Um, you know, we don't want folks to potentially have the flu and COVID. Um, you know, that could create a, a much more enhanced and uh, negative outcome or longer uh, illness duration. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, we do know that the flu shot is uh, dependent on the year anywhere from 40 to 60 percent effective in preventing you from actually getting the flu. And for those who do get their shot, uh, even if you happen to unfortunately still get the flu, uh, more than likely it's going to be a much milder, milder case with a quicker recovery period. Uh, the other, the other thing, and the other reason we're really, um, you know, encouraging folks to get their flu shots now, and again, it's readily available throughout the county. Whether you, uh, you know, go to your primary care physician or some of the pharmacies in the community, um, the sooner the better, so that you can start building up 
uh, the antibodies and, and, and it can become effective. Um, you know, it is about a two to three week lag before the efficacy builds up enough to give you protection after you get your shot. So even if you got it today, um, you really wouldn't be fully protected until almost the end of October. Uh, but, the, you know, the other thing that, you know, we saw a lot of last uh, year when COVID came on the scene uh, was really around the lack of uh, bed capacity and the lack of ventilators uh, that were available in our healthcare facilities, even here locally in our community. And, you know, the more folks we can get protected for the flu from the flu and, uh, you know, potentially keep them from having to utilize uh, that the, the um, health care services, the emergency rooms and the uh, bed capacity and, and the ventilators if needed, the better. Because, uh, again, if we do see continuing increased cases with COVID uh, and we do need that type of, um, you know, capacity, we don't want to be competing uh, again with one another. So the more we can get folks vaccinated earlier, the better protected they're going to be from the flu overall. And uh, it'll only help as far as uh, overall in the community, especially with uh, concurrent issue and illness with uh, COVID. Great. Uh, Billy and I, um, we already have our flu shot. Uh, we got our flu shot a few weeks ago. And normally we get ours every year. Normally we're like the only one at the pharmacy. There is we're a line behind a couple of people, a couple of people behind us uh, waiting. I've never seen that before. Do you have any stats? Do you get any feedback on whether people are getting uh, flu shots at a higher rate? Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen any preliminary data yet. Um, we do find out later in the year kind of what our county, um, you know, vaccination rates, uh, you know, end up being uh, overall once things are reported. Um, like I said, we do know there's plenty of access to it right now, uh, which is why we're strongly encouraging folks to go get it now. Um, but, you know, we, we haven't seen any uh, uh, data yet on the, you know, uh, utilization or, uh, you know, the folks that are going to get that currently. Um, but, you know, we're, we're hoping again that uh, we'll, we'll see more, um, you know, starting to go get that now, um, that we're really starting to see some more PSAs and push around the need and the importance of getting the flu shot, uh, especially every year, but especially this year with COVID. I, uh, I, we're, we both are big believers in flu shots. We've gotten them for, I don't know, 30, the entire time we've been married every year. So, um, which is coming up on 30 years. So, uh, the, uh, Paul, the other thing related to flu and related to a lot of that stuff we've already talked about is we're also coming into colder weather. People are going to be inside more using uh, indoor uh, heating and cool heating systems, whatnot. Uh, what do you? What's your concerns? What's your message? Are, do you have a concern that this might drive higher prevalence in the community as we get into the colder months? Yeah, I mean we've touched on it a little bit already, but you know, obviously when you close buildings up and they become tight, you know, you, you put your storm windows down, you don't have any more fresh air, uh, you're running your uh, furnace, uh, you know, those type of things. You you typically have more. Uh, you know, uh, intimate gathering, so to speak, when, when you can't go outside and do, you know, birthday parties and other types of events. Um, you know, so obviously it, it, it's a concern. I mean, it's it's going to happen, right? There's a cold weather here. We live in western New York and it's, it's coming probably sooner than many of us would like. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, the, the best thing we can do is continue to practice those um, prevention measures that, you know, exist, whether it's indoors or outdoors. Um, you know, one thing we would encourage, again, is, is folks to make sure they can you know, get as, as high level of, a, you know, a MERV uh, um, rated filter they can for their furnace. Um, you know, again, this has been a strategy that the state has used in different settings. Um, you know, the higher MERV rating, the, the potential uh, for removing virus and, and different types of, um, uh, you know, stuff out of the air as it passes through the, the HVAC system um, is better, um, you know, obviously, but you need to make sure it's in line with whatever your um, furnace is uh, able to handle. Uh, but ultimately, you know, um, you know, try to reduce uh, exposures to people, especially that you don't live with on a normal basis, because, uh, again, you don't necessarily know where they are, or who they've been in contact with. And again, the, the normal things, frequent hand washing, uh, making sure, again, if you, if you are coughing, um, you know, covering your mouth appropriately with your elbow um, this way, not with your hand, uh, you know, make sure, you know, again, if you're not able to make those social distances that you're wearing uh, face coverings appropriately. Uh, kind of what I wanted to wrap up with is uh, just a discussion, Paul. Uh, you know, I know you pay a lot of attention to what's going on globally with this and the science side of it. What are you seeing? Uh, kind of what's your prognostication of when we're sort of out of this? Uh, does it rely on a vaccine? Does it, uh, and where are we at with that? Treatments? I mean, kind of how are you feeling about uh, the future with this? Yeah, I, you know, um, 
you know, it, it, it's a tough one. So obviously, as you look around uh, what's going on globally and even on the national stage with uh, access to a vaccine, um, you know, you, you hear different stories, right? Um, you know, again, I don't have any special intel uh, on, on where we are specifically with these type of vaccines. We do know that there's several, um, you know, drug companies, manufacturers that are in stage three trials. Uh, when they're able to hit the market with it um, is really anybody's guess. We hear uh, anywhere from potentially the end of this month through you know, early, mid-December, uh, we may start to see some vaccine coming to market. Uh, but what we do know is it's not going to be readily available to start mass vaccinations and, and try to get uh, everybody vaccinated that, you know, could be and should be. Um, you know, so when it does roll out, it's going to be fairly limited, um, you know, it's similar to what we saw with H1N1 a decade ago. So ultimately, we are currently in the process of developing our uh, uh, COVID distribution, COVID vaccination plans uh, locally. Um, you know, there are some guidelines coming out from the state, and ultimately, it's putting together a, a profile and plan on how we can get that distributed to our residents as quickly as possible when the vaccine does become available. And it's going to be a you know multifaceted plan using you know all of our different typical resources: healthcare providers, primary care physicians, pharmacies, the local health department. Um, you know, again, to get it distributed as widely as possible. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, um, it's going to be targeted as, 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 as it should be, obviously, for our higher risk folks, you know, the, our seniors, our elderly, those with uh, immune compromised health systems, underlying health issues. That's where the vaccine is going to be targeted and given to first. So ultimately, um, you know, the healthier adults and kids, um, they're going to be more in the second waves uh, when the vaccine comes along. Uh, but I, I honestly think, I mean, and if you look at all indicators, we're, we're well into, you know, probably the early to mid part of next year before um, there's uh, enough vaccine to be able to, to do the type of mass vaccination and develop that larger herd immunity uh, that, uh, you know, is talked about frequently uh, just due to the fact of the volume and the need of the vaccine. Um, so I, I think we're in this for a little bit longer. Uh, you know, obviously through probably the winter anyways, as far as, um, you know, trying to get the vaccine out there and get folks vaccinated and protected. Uh, but we are we are hopeful that we can get a vaccine that's very effective, uh, that can, um, you know, essentially um, put us in a position where we don't have to worry about uh, large COVID spread in our communities. I mean, it's, it's here. It's not going to be going away. Um, it's, it's a virus now that we'll still probably see spread and still cases uh, over some time. But obviously the goal has been to uh, you know, develop a herd immunity, get a vaccine that, so that we can protect, especially those that are most vulnerable. And again, that's our seniors if you compromised and uh, those with underlying health conditions. Thank you, Paul. Uh, is, I'm pretty much uh, through my questions. Is there anything we didn't touch on that you want to be sure the community knows about? Uh, you know, again, I just like to reiterate and, uh, you know, um, just from myself here, you know, I, I appreciate and understand this has been a long seven months. Um, you know, we, we've all felt that at different levels. And, you know, ultimately, as I just mentioned, I think we have a little bit uh, of ways to go here. So I would encourage, uh, you know, as much patience um, as, as folks have. I, I know um, that's a short end and short supply in some areas. Um, you know, but again, a vaccine is hopefully coming. Uh, we're, we're continuing to advocate um, daily for us locally here, especially in the rural areas for, for the testing capacity or some additional relief on some of these, uh, uh, you know, areas with the uh, guidelines and, and some of the closures and, and capacity issues. You know, again, um, we do believe that there should be a little more flexibility in some of these areas, especially with low infection rates overall. Uh, so we, we are advocating, we are working with all of our elected officials to, you know, push back on some of these things. Uh, you know, but ultimately, um, you know, the, the more that we can, um, you know, uh, work together, as we've said many times, we are in this together locally as a community and as a region. Uh, you know, but, you know, it's kind of our, our message that we've done all along. You know, stay home if you're sick. Um, you know, uh, go get the COVID test. Again, if you can get it, especially if you're sick, uh, you can get that symptomatic testing. And, uh, you know, ultimately, we'll continue to um, push out information, provide updated data. Uh, daily as we have been doing and you know we're happy to continue to share and communicate any uh, late breaking news or things that may be relevant uh, to helping us keep safe as a community as we move forward. Great Paul thank you again for your time I know you're very busy and things been ramping up so I appreciate it. All right not a problem anytime. So this is Howard Owens uh, sign off from Batavian uh, remember uh, wear your mask and keep your distance and I'll hopefully see you all around. <laughs>